Okay, Luke Acts uh, is the series. Luke Acts for Beginners. This is lesson number 15, title of the lesson, Post, or Peter's Post Pentecost Ministry, Acts chapter three. If you're following along in your Bible, you can open up to Acts chapter three. But I will be showing this, the uh, scriptures on the, uh, uh, on the slides. So let's take a look at where we are in our outline. Always helps us to kind of get back into the book. The ministry of Peter, remember I said the book of Acts, easy to outline, first half roughly is the ministry of Peter, second half is the ministry of Paul. Peter's first sermon, talked about that last week in Acts chapter one, all the way to 247. In this section, Luke describes the, the waiting apostles receiving, remember what the word was, empowerment, as the Holy Spirit comes upon them on Pentecost Sunday. We read Peter's first gospel sermon and the thousands who responded in repentance and baptism. Luke then describes the forming and the development of the early church as it practiced the five biblical ministries of the church, evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, service. Luke then concludes his first section by declaring that the Lord added to his church as they exercised the biblical ministries. And of course this leads to the next section of the book, and that's uh, what happens after Pentecost, because we read about that, it's pretty exciting, but what happens after the day of Pentecost? So in this section, we're going to see how quickly Peter uh, gets into trouble, because trouble ensues. So in Acts chapter three, let's uh, read the couple of verses there. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and the man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us and he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So Luke wastes no time commenting on the events of Pentecost Sunday. He, he moves his story along by recounting an event that was as great as the Pentecost miracle, but involved only one man this time. So the first thing that strikes the reader concerning this account is the sureness of the miracle. If we review, the beggar was well known by the people having been infirmed from birth. Everybody knew this guy. Everybody knew his condition. His infirmity was complete. He could not walk. And we see this as he had to be carried to and from his usual spot each day at the gate of the temple. He is healed and he immediately walks into the temple with the apostles praising God and literally, if you, if, you, if you were to translate the phrase, literally jumping for joy. And the people who knew and saw him regularly witnessed the before and the after of his healing. There was no doubt who this person was and what was wrong with him. And now all of a sudden this fellow is you know, walking and you know, jumping in the air and rejoicing. Now they may have wondered how he was healed, but there was no doubt that he was indeed healed of an incurable condition. So as verse 10 indicates, the people were filled with wonder at what they had seen. So the miracle sets the scene for Peter's first defense of the gospel before the Jewish leadership. Now the miracle of tongues may have been baffling to some, and others found other ways of denying it. Remember they said, oh, these guys are drunk. You know, they're drinking early in the day. However, this particular miracle was indisputable in its power and its result, as well as its source. You know, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ. 
So Peter did not even ask if the man believed or not. That's real power. You know that someone has real power. Whether you believe or not, it's not the point. You're healed, that's power. He pronounced him healed in the name of Jesus or by the authority of Jesus. So now we see the response of the people in Acts 3. In Acts 2, Luke summarized the activity of the early church in Jerusalem as the day of Pentecost came and went and the life returned to normal. Remember we read that last time? It said, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing as anyone uh, might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So in the following chapter, he doubles back and he focuses on the healing of one man and the events that took place as a result of this miracle. And so let's continue reading now, jump forward to Acts 3. It says, while he was, this is the, the man who had been healed, while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is, the, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. So uh, as uh, in the case of uh, them speaking in tongues, this undeniable miracle draws a large crowd. See, I'm just trying to you know, show you the parallel between Pentecost and this, this miracle here. And in the same way that people wondered about the apostles speaking in foreign languages through the power of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, now they're amazed. Literal translation, the word here, amazed, dumbfounded. They're dumbfounded and they're waiting for an explanation. They saw, they believed the what, they now wanted to know the how. So this presents a second opportunity for Peter to address a large crowd with the gospel message. And he follows the pattern that he used in his, you know, his uh, Pentecost sermon. Same outline, if you wish. He begins by establishing Jesus as the source of spiritual power demonstrated in the miracle by virtue of the fact that He is God's Messiah. He reminds them of their culpability in sending their own Savior to the cross in exchange for a notorious murderer. He then proclaims the resurrection of Jesus and the fact that he and John were eyewitnesses of this great event. And then Peter gives glory to Jesus for the healing of the lame man and explains this is the how. This is how this man was healed, through the power of Jesus Christ. Now in Acts chapter 240, Luke writes that after initially preaching to the crowd, Peter kept on exhorting them. That was on Pentecost Sunday. In other words, he continued to make arguments and encouragements for the people to respond in obedience to the gospel message. In Acts 2, Luke does not provide any more information as to the nature of these exhortations, only the result. He, he just writes, he kept on encouraging them. And then he doesn't say how or what he said, he just gives the result. And then he says 3,000 were baptized on that day. In Acts chapter three, you know, in this situation with the, uh, with the man who was healed, Luke continues to record Peter's sermon in addition to the results it received. So we read, and now brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. 
Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So in these verses, Peter mitigates their failure in receiving Jesus by stating that they did this in ignorance and his rejection and death were spoken of by the prophets. Their sins did not surprise God, that's the point. Yes, you did an awful thing, but it didn't surprise God. The prophets said that this is what was going to happen. And as grave as this was, God was nevertheless offering them and their leaders forgiveness and the peace of mind along with the blessings that come from God that those who are forgiven enjoy. Yes, he says, you did a terrible thing. This Jesus, who is the Messiah, the proof of which is this man who has just been healed because of him, you did a terrible thing, but God is still willing to offer you forgiveness. So in Acts chapter 3, verse 20, it says, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren to him you shall give heed and everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall utterly be destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onwards also announced these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Remember, why am I reading this? Because this is the, he kept on exhorting them, this is the nature of the, of the exhortation that he gave to these people. So here Peter turns their gaze from the present judgment to the judgment to come at the end of the world when Jesus returns. And he emphasizes the fact that Jesus, who was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, will return to, quote, restore all things. Restore what? Well, to restore the proper order with God and Christ and the church ruling. The old heaven and earth replaced by the new heaven and earth. Satan and the, the, the wicked angels and the disbelievers uh, punished. That's the order, that's the restoration. This restoration, he says, was spoken of by Moses and the prophets and was offered first to you, he says, the Jewish people. So he sums everything up in verse 26. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked, from your wicked ways. So he sums everything up in this verse by reiterating that Jesus' resurrection, which is the proof of his divinity, the proof of his messiahship, was given to them first with the purpose of turning them away from their sins. What sins? Well, the sin of disbelief. And the present and future judgment to come. And so, you know, despite the terrible things that they did, he says, there's hope. There's hope. This is how good God is. He sent Jesus to you, you first. You get to believe first. You're the first fruits. And so he doesn't deny their role in God's plan. He said, yeah, you made a mistake, you did a terrible thing, but God's plan is still for you to receive salvation first. So the second event that took place as a result of the healing, the first event is Peter gets to preach another sermon to a large crowd. The second event that takes place is that Peter and John are arrested. So as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So while Peter is speaking, he and John are interrupted and arrested by various you know, groups, the priests, several priests that belong to the, 
24 groups of priests who were selected by lot to conduct services at the temple on various days. In other words, who arrested him? Who, you know, what, what group of people came to stop them? Well, among them there were priests. Not, not all the priests who were priests were at the temple at the same time. They took turns. If you remember with uh, Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, I'll leave this slide here, we'll just jump back to Luke chapter one, remember that? Now it happened that while he was performing, this is Zacharias, John, John the Baptist's father, now it happened while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointment order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. There were a lot of priests, you know, the 365 days in the year, well there were a lot more than 365 priests and they were you know, broken up into divisions. And they, they selected lots, you know, and they, they had an order. They served in different turns. So the priests that were on duty at the time at the temple, they were part of the group that came in to stop Peter and John from preaching. Who else does he mention? He mentions the captain of the guard, captain of the temple guards. These would be Levites who served as temple police, if you wish guarding entrances, closing the gates on the Sabbath, ensuring laws concerning movement and conduct in the temple area were obeyed. You know, uh, Gentile converts could go into, the, into a certain <clears throat> area to worship, but they couldn't go any further in. Women had a spot where they could go, but they couldn't go everywhere and so on and so forth. So the temple police were in charge of that. And then he said the Sadducees, the Sadducees were priests, a certain sect, a certain group of priests, wealthy, wealthy priests who were part of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council. So the Sadducees, being of the highest rank, probably instigated the arrest, and they did so not because there was disorder or too big a crowd, but because of the things that were being taught. As the principal group that argued for Jesus' execution, any talk of His resurrection and subsequent growth of His movement would ultimately come back on them. They're the ones who tried Him. They're the ones that you know, stirred up the mob. They're the ones that appealed to Pilate, crucify Him. No, no, we don't want Barabbas. You know, we want this guy to be, you know, to be crucified. We'll trade you, you know, we'll take Barabbas, you take him. The, the priests, they're the ones that did this. So if Jesus' movement is starting to grow and become popular after his death and claimed a resurrection, it all comes back on them. They feared the loss of authority and, and position and the privileges that came with these. They also denied the existence of spirits and angels or afterlife and only accepted the first five books of the Bible as authority. So a risen Savior would also disprove their teaching position on miracles and the afterlife. Although they were few in number, the Sadducees wielded tremendous influence because they commanded great wealth and social position and because of the family of the high priest uh, belonged to their group. So let's keep reading, jump ahead, Acts 4, verse 4. But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Again, Luke, as he does for the Pentecost sermon, records the response of the crowd. In other words, they believed. And the number who became Christians, 2,000 plus. In other words, 5,000, the 3,000 on Pentecost Sunday, and now 2,000 more. And he says, men. Certainly not just men were baptized, but he represents the size of the number by saying the group that believed 2,000 men, so you can extrapolate, add women and children, households. Again, he simply mentions that they went from 3,000 to 5,000, a way of giving a general estimate of the rate of growth. Now he doesn't mention baptism or the need to confess Christ, because this has already been described as necessary in the process of conversion. Faith is expressed how? By confessing Jesus, repenting of our sins, and being baptized. 
There's no need to continually repeat this every single time a writer is describing a person's conversion. Remember I said that's, there's a rule here of study. The writers didn't write everything there was to know about a, a particular topic every time they mentioned that topic. Because if, if, if the writers of the New Testament, if every time they were talking about the conversion of someone, they had to also mention that that person believed and that person confessed their faith and that person repented and then that person was immersed in, uh, in water and then that person lived a faithful life. If they had to give all those details every single time that they mentioned conversion, the Bible would be 10 million pages long because they'd have to do that for every topic. So you know, although it's mentioned often, when, when, when Luke is writing that people were converted, He's assuming that the readers understand what that means and what that, in, what that entails. So Luke merely states the conclusion and the response to Peter's sermon. 2,000 plus people were converted on that day. Now the third event resulting from Peter's preaching, you know, the miracle, the arrest, the third event, a trial before Jewish leaders in Acts chapter four, Let's keep reading. It says, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem and Annas, the high priest, was there and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of high, uh, priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So although Peter and John are brought before the Jewish leaders for questioning and possible imprisonment, Luke shows that this occasion quickly becomes the scene for Peter's third sermon. You can't keep these preachers down. You know. <laughs> Just ask him a question in front of a crowd and crank him up and let him go. And that's what he does, right? So this is given to a much smaller audience, but one with the most wealth and power in Israel. As in Luke's custom, he provides historical and personal detail by naming some of the prominent men that were present and their positions. The rulers, those were the high priests and, and his family. Annas and Caiaphas. Annas, uh, Caiaphas was Annas' son-in-law. He was the one who was actually high priest at the time. Annas carried the title because he had formerly been high priest. And all the Sadducees were there. The elders, those were chief men appointed to the Sanhedrin. 70 to 72 rulers, elders, scribes. And then the scribes themselves, the rabbis, the lawyers, the Pharisees. Note that they asked Peter and John the same question that they had posed Jesus when they had confronted him in the temple courtyard. Remember that? Remember what they said to him? By what authority are you doing these things? In other words, how dare you? Who told you you could do this? You know, clean out the temple and knock over the money changer tables. You know, who, who are you? <laughs> who told you you could do such a thing? They say the same thing to Peter. And Peter's response or sermon is the direct fulfillment of what Jesus prophesied in Luke 11 and 12. So let's jump back there. Jesus said, when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So Luke even says as much when prefacing Peter's remarks by saying that he was speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Luke records the heart of Peter's sermon. The miracle, he says, was done by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Bang. The rulers were responsible for his execution by crucifixion. Boy, he didn't mince words, did he? 
Number three, God raised this Jesus from the dead that the leaders would reject the one chosen by God, the Messiah, was spoken of by the prophet David. This would have especially been galling to hear since the high priest and other priests in the Sanhedrin were Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection or afterlife. And then finally, Peter finishes with a summary statement that makes Jesus and faith in Him the exclusive pathway to salvation. Why do we think, Christians, we're the only ones going to have, well, yeah. why, why aren't we more inclusive? Why, why don't we say, come on, everybody, we're all going to heaven, just be, could you just not be a, like, just be a nice person. Be a nice person and, and you'll go to heaven. I, I, if God said that that would be the case, wouldn't that be so much easier to preach? Unfortunately, we get to Acts chapter four, and there Luke, by the power of the Spirit, happens to spoil all of our nice inclusiveness by saying, there's only one name under heaven by which we can be saved, only one. There goes my inclusive dream. I mean, I can be as inclusive as I want to be. Unfortunately, I shouldn't say that, but you know, contrary to the Bible, the Bible is very exclusive. Why do you think people were killed and, and martyred and thrown into the arena to be eaten by lions? Do you think that they were, do you think that happened to them because they were nice people? because as men they were faithful to their wives? No, they were, they were thrown in and beaten and, and killed and murdered in all kinds of creative ways, why? Because they dared say there's only one God and there's only one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ. <laughs> so the leaders, you know, they're not happy with this. Not at all. And Luke records this, is now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they had ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it will not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people, because they were all glorifying God for what had happened for the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been, um, had been performed. So the leaders would have wanted to punish and silence them, but for uh, three reasons they couldn't. First reason, they couldn't deny Peter's sermon. Many in the city thought the same about Jesus and they had no rebuttal to Peter's argument based on scripture. Jesus was the rejected Messiah, according to Psalms 118.23. They had no answer for that. Secondly, they couldn't deny the obvious miracle. They may have even known or recognized this crippled beggar, now completely healed, standing before them. And thirdly, they couldn't deny the apostles uh, their freedom. Taking action against them would create a riot, and this would, you know, this would uh, uh, demonstrate to the Roman government that these people were not able to maintain order. I mean, they were only there to keep the Jews, you know, keep them calm and keep them quiet. If they couldn't do that, they'd get somebody, the Romans would get somebody else to do it, to do it for them. 
So Luke records the joy and the praise and the prayers that the church experiences after the release of Peter and John. Now remember that only a few weeks before, Jesus had been brought to stand before these very same men and had subsequently been crucified. The apostles and the church gained great confidence after this event. And Luke records that, he says, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So the story of Peter and John's defense of the gospel and release sparks a surge in the growth and development of the church and the expanded ministry of all the apostles. You know, this victory energizes everybody and they go forward. Luke uses this occasion to introduce a prominent character who will appear later on when he begins to describe Paul's ministry. And that is Joseph, a Levite or a temple worker, a security worker from Cyprus. Uh, he was a foreign born Jew. He was called Barnabas, son of encouragement. Um, he's the first temple official who was converted by the apostles. All right, I'm going to stop there in our textual. Couple of lessons we can draw from the readings that we have today. Uh, one lesson, Jesus doesn't need someone's faith in order to act. Our faith in Him is important, but not the determining factor for His actions. His will is the determining factor in what He does, not how great our faith is. Strong faith, you know, it helps us to know and accept His will. It helps us to persevere when we don't understand or we disagree with His will. My prayer of faith hopes that His will is done and that I can trust and rejoice in it, even if I don't always understand it. You know, in our culture, we got to understand everything before we do something. That's not how it works in Christianity. God does not have to give us all the details. He doesn't. And then just two lessons. Let's try to keep the gospel simple, shall we? In Acts 4, 8 to 12, Peter makes five important points in five verses of text that takes about 40 seconds to read. And he's speaking to you know, the most educated people in his society. Five points, 40 seconds, no more than 10 verses, imagine. So we don't begin by explaining the gospel. We begin by proclaiming the gospel. The life, the death, the resurrection of Christ and our response. There's a little bit of a pride, I would imagine when we're sharing our faith with someone and we begin by explaining the details of everything about the gospel to the person as if the simple telling of the story has no power in itself. But it is the simple telling of the gospel in its plainness that has power. Now what does Paul say in Romans 1.16? Right? The power of God unto salvation is what? I'm not ashamed of the, the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He doesn't say, uh, I'm not ashamed of you explaining the gospel in detail, for that is the power of God. You know? Of course, there needs to be explanation. Why? Because there are questions. But when we begin sharing our faith, we ought to begin simply by telling the story that Jesus is God, came on earth as a human being that lived and taught and died on the cross to pay the moral debt of our sins, was buried. Three days later he was resurrected and now he calls everyone to believe on him in order to be forgiven and to have eternal life. Whoops, how long did that take? 10 seconds? You tell that to somebody, you don't think that person will say, okay, well, now wait a minute, now you said that's when the explaining comes. So when it comes to the gospel, simple thing to remember, proclaim first, then explain. Okay. 
All right, our assignment for next week as always, I remind you, we don't have time to read everything in class that we cover, so if you read it ahead of time, you know, it's fresh in your mind and we can deal with the passages, Acts 5, verses 1 to 42, and that's our lesson for today. Thank you for your attention.